want to read to you a scripture from an epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. It's on the theme reconnection, and our focus this morning is reignite your love, my Lord. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 11. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone say that with me, love is of God. So if someone were to ask you, where does love come from, what would you say? God, love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You know, I want to start again from that whole verse, but I want us all to read verse 7 together. Can we do that? That's all right, because this is the most important verse, even if we don't do anything else this morning. Let's read it from verse 7 where it says, beloved. Let's read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then in verse 8 it says, he who does not love, look at this one, does not know God. Wow. Woo, we could almost stop right there. Uh, listen, I, I'm going to be good. For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, my Lord. Someone just thank the Lord for the word right now. This is hot. It's a great scripture. It's a great text that works in church situations and family situations and any other kind of situations. And the first thing I want to share with you is that not all love or what we call love is the same. Every one of these words here is talking about a word called agape love. Someone say with me, agape. You see, there's all different kinds of love, and, and we hit some of these the last time we shared, so you'll have to check it out and, on, a, uh, on, our, on our stream from two weeks ago, but our media team helped me with a graphic. So can they show that graphic for you right now? It's a graphic that we put together to define, wow, look at that. I can't read it. <laughs> with my eyes, it's kind of hard. And, and this is a graphic that shows Four, it looks like a little pyramid. Don't get too hung up on the graphic, uh, on the way, on the order of it. But you see, can you read that top box there? What, what is, wow, you all have good eyes. I'm going to clap for you. <laughs> Someone needs to pray for Pastor Aubrey's eyes. That first one there says eros. That was, see, these, each of these boxes are representative of four Greek words that were used at the time of the writings. Of the, of the New Testament. So they would describe or define love using different words, different kinds of loves. And the first word you see there is eros, which means sexual love. It means physical intimacy. You will not see this word too often in the New Testament, but it existed amongst their common times. What's the second word that we see there? Phileo. This is where we get Philadelphia from, or Phila. It means spontaneous natural affection, which is for friends. How many people in here, you have close friends? All right. Let's go ahead and thank God for all the friends you have in your life. You see, you ever heard a person say, I love you like a friend, but not like that? Well, see, we use one word for it, but they had different words in the Greek. So you see that word phileo there, that means friend. What's that third word say there, somebody? Storge, and that's natural affection between kinfolk. Someone finish this statement for me. Blood is thicker than? Water. Oh, but listen to y'all. You had some of the same parents. That you, you, and, and what does that mean when someone says blood is thicker than water? It, it means you have friends. Oh, I'm going to tell you a story. But then you have family. You, you know, my mother, she went to be with the Lord in 2020. And every once in a while, when in my youth, I would get, you know, ahead of myself. Oh, Lord, I'm going to tell some business here. And, and she would look at me some days and she'd say, Aubrey, I'm your mother. I am not your friend. <laughs> How many of you had a parent that, that would remind you, we're not friends? 
all right? You can't talk to me the way you talk to your, your friends, all right? And, and why? Because in Storgate, you got different rules. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? And, and, and how you treat your blood or some of the hierarchy, it's different than just the way you treat your friends. Y'all are so quiet with me this morning. And, and you see, so you have all of these different dimensions of eros and phileo and of storge. And, and what many of us celebrated at Thanksgiving was storge. How many of you, you saw family members you haven't seen in a while? I'm going to provoke some people here. How many of you, you you're not, you know, you know, seeing them once a year is fine. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, you know, it's storge that sometimes we'll say, well, it doesn't matter what they did. That's family, right? And we stick together because it has a different meaning than just friendship. Now, with that last word there, it says, what's that last word say, somebody? Agape. And it says, that's God's kind of love that is divinely inspired. I want you to take a picture of this with your phone if you can because it shows four different words that are used in the Greek for the word love. You know, eros you see on radio, on, on social media, and all the rest that are very seldom used. Phileo we see in different texts in the New Testament. Storge, it almost comes natural. And for many of us, we think of love through some combination of these three things. But what the Bible teaches us is that agape love is really not the kind of love that we learn on our own. Oh, Jesus. That agape love comes from God. That once we say yes to Jesus, hallelujah, accept him as our Savior and Lord, and he enters into our life and takes residence in our soul, and the Holy Spirit begins to preside and to reside and begin to emit his life through us, one of the things that happen in us is we begin to manifest God's love. Oh, someone needs to thank God right now, my Lord. It's different. Someone say with me, it's a different kind of love. So what this is, is saying that this agape love, this fourth dimension, this deeper love in verse 7, is of God. Oh, someone needs to get this. You see, when we relate to one another before Christ, we're probably relating to one another out of the one of the three. But once Jesus comes into our life and we begin to receive God's love in us, we should be showing God's love out of us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it says, and everyone who loves is born of God. That's the test. Tell your neighbors, just say there's a test. Go ahead and tell them that. You see, I was thinking this figure, I was actually having a conversation with the apostle, and I said, one of the challenges that people have is after we say yes to Jesus, we want to love the people the way we did before Jesus. Someone's going to get that in a second. Either through arrows, which we're not supposed to see each other as, or filio, we want to go deeper than that, or even storge, but God is saying there is a deeper love a deeper dimension that comes from me that you don't even know about yet. We have to learn to love the way God wants us to love. It's not natural. I'm going to take my time this morning. It's not instinctive. Sometimes it doesn't even feel right or feel good. It goes counter to our flesh. Counter, you guys are so silent with me this morning. Counter to our emotions. It's easier for us to do something different. But God's saying, I want you to love a different kind of way. And one of the things that we learn about God's love, and when I just looked at this scripture, I began to bask in it, is one of the, the themes or the context is God loves because of who God is. God doesn't love us because of what we've done. He doesn't love me because of who he thinks I could be. He doesn't love me because of how great I am or my righteousness or anything else. It says, while we were yet sinners, God loves us. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. God loves us because of who God is. He saw you at some point in eternity, and he says, I love you, regardless of what you've done. I want to set some people free in here this morning. Sometimes we can sin, make a mistake, and say, wow, how could God love me? I don't even love myself. But God's love for you has never been predicated about what you've done. God loves you unconditionally. God loves you out of his own being because all love originates out of who God is. Someone needs to thank God right now. 
So if you've made a mistake, hear this word. God still loves you, my God. God still has a way for you. God still has a path for you. Can someone rejoice with me on that this morning? My Lord. That's who God is. You know, in all the scholarship, one of the things that you'll see about God's love is it says God loves us when we're unlovable. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The first time I heard that, I said, wow. You mean when I've messed up, when I'm broken up, when I've made all kinds of errors and mistakes, I'm not even worthy of love, but yet God still loves me. He loves the unlovable. It's not predicated on you. It's predicated on who he is. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and thank the Lord right now for his love. Just say, oh, just say thank you, Jesus, for you. Go ahead and worship him this morning. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Why is that essential? Because that's the kind of love that moved God's heart to say, I've got to send a son. I've got to send someone to die for you. I've got to send someone to create a path, even though you're not worthy because of the love that I have for you. The first point is agape love comes from God through a born again experience and it is revealed through the people who are walking with him. One of the signs of a believer is when that God kind of love flows through us. If God loves us when we're unlovable, that means we have to love one another when we are unlovable. Oh, somebody help me in the house this morning. You see, Eros doesn't do that. Phileo doesn't always do that. And for some of us, storge love doesn't even do that. How many people you've ever seen a family member get disowned? You hurt me too bad. I never want to see you again. Divisions, factions. I'm talking to someone in here this morning. Sometimes even family love doesn't even withstand some of those things. But when agape love comes into your life, even some of those divisions you start building bridges to. Something in you becomes unsettled. We've got to resolve this. We've got to reconcile this. My Lord, I'm going to give you a... We had a, 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 there's a, a former pastor here. He went to be with the Lord. His name is Bishop or Apostle William Rome. And he's a wonderful brother. And I, I used to, I love him like a father. He's a spiritual father. And, and one of the things that he did, how many of you, you remember Pastor Roan? And, and Pastor Roan, in the early days of, a, of Abundant Life Fellowship, we were at a different church. He was a different kind of pastor. He would, he would bring the hammer of the word. The Holy Spirit would fall. But hear this. But growing up, he was a boxer in Philadelphia. And so one day, you know, I walked outside of the church and uh, Pastor Roan, he said, come here for a second, Aubrey. And he had me and a couple of the other younger guys here. Our parents are going to get mad at this story. And he said, do you know how to box? <laughs> and, and, and Pastor Roan taught us how to throw a jab. And, and I remember him. I said, wow, this dude is awesome. He, he loves the Lord. And he, he's teaching us how to hold our hands. And, 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 and he taught us the jabs. And I, you know, he gave us all the stories about how he was a big-time boxer. And he said, but when I get, you know, gave my life to the Lord, I stopped. I stopped boxing. And he said, I cried for X amount of days. His, sister, his daughter Sharon and his kids attend church. And he said, I cried. And I never got the complete story until his homegoing service where one of his friends came and they gave the story about Pastor Ronan. And they said, he was a great boxer. But what he always told us is, to be a good boxer, you need a killer instinct. Check this out, real story. He said something about a boxer that says when you hit a man and he's hurt, take him out. When he's down, knock him out. But he says once I got saved, my killer instinct was gone. Really. He says that what makes a good boxer a boxer, the Holy Spirit took that out of me. Where I could no longer see a person hurt and go take him out. You know, when you get filled with Jesus, oh Lord and get filled with the Holy, the Holy Spirit, instincts change. Do I have any witnesses of that, somebody? I can't yell the way I used to yell. I can't hit the way I used to hit. You try to yell at someone and the Holy Spirit says, don't say anything, my Lord. <laughs> someone does something to you and you want to get them back and you're like, I, I can't. You know? And it's because the Holy Spirit is working a work inside your life and you're being filled with agape love. I cannot react the same anymore because it's a deeper level of love that God's filling me with. Oh, someone give the Lord a shout of praise in the house, my Lord. Something's different 
about me, my Lord. See, one of the things that we have to realize is when we, I just feel like taking my time with this this morning. When we get saved, our reactions change. Our reactions should change. How we treat people when they're unlovable should change. It influences our behavior. Why? Because it's not arrows, it's not phileo, it's not storge, it's agape that's flowing inside me. So after I get saved, I start drilling down on the love that God's working out of my life, my Lord. You know, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we had touched a few of these before, you know, the John chapter 1 gives us all where we get love from and how to define it. But 1 Corinthians 13, I love it because it gives some of the behaviors of it. And I'm going to read to you a verse from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. And it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am what? Nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Look at these behaviors, starting in verse 4. Love, let's read these together. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own, is not provoked thinks no evil, my Lord. So someone needs to praise God for that right now. You can almost look at each of those behaviors and say, wait a minute now, Pastor Aubrey, you're saying first I've got to drill down into this deeper kind of agape love. Yeah. And when you drill down on that love and you experience it and you let it get manifested, these are some of the behaviors we should see. You know, we don't always talk about, you know, the, we talk about giving your life to Jesus, we don't always talk about some of the evidences of that decision. Oh, my Lord. Jesus. We talk about, you should accept me as I am, but we don't talk about the change that should take place. Oh my Lord. We talk about God loves me and he accepts me, but we don't talk about the fruits and the life and the walk of the believer. We like to talk about don't judge me, but yet we don't want anyone to inspect our fruits. Oh, Lord, my God. There's evidences, oh, Lord. There are fruits. There is a walk of the believer that when someone's around you, they should know that you know God, that you walk with God, that you're communing with God, that you're worshiping God, that you love God, and that God's in you and speaking through you and breathing through you and manifesting himself through you through the ways that you show yourself and love other people. There is an evidence, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. And so often people will want to say, just take me as is, but that's no longer good enough. Oh, Lord, my God. We have to take one another according to the words of God, and we should expect, oh, Lord, to see a change. You should change. Someone pointed at me and say, you should change, Pastor Aubrey. Go ahead and tell me. I should change. You should change. Someone else should change. We should be growing every day according to the agape love that God has worked in us. Do so you receive that in the house this morning? Am I being too direct with somebody, my Lord? You see, one of the mistakes we make is people look at believers, but they don't see the changes. Oh, Jesus. When I walk into the house of God, and then I walk anywhere else, I see the same behaviors. That's what some people say. But what the Word of God says, oh no, when you know God, and since God is love and God is in you, you should be manifesting agape love. So that when we walk through the church, we should say, wow, when you're mad at each other, you still love one another. Wow, you guys don't take pride amongst yourselves. Wow, you guys, it doesn't matter what you do. If you don't love one another, you say, let's stop what we're doing and demonstrate that you're different than what's going on in my job. You're different than what's going on in my associations. You're different than what's going on in my streets. You're different than what's going on anywhere else I am. The house of God is different, my Lord. We need to show that change, embody that change, and manifest that change. Are you with me in the house this morning, somebody? Say with me, help us, Lord, to love. Go ahead and say that. Now go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. We need it. We need it. 
So Paul, in the book of Corinthians, he gives all of those behaviors of love. The second point is identify true love and cultivate it within yourself. It has to be cultivated. Say with me, it's not natural. It's supernatural. Go ahead and say it. If you don't know Jesus, this is all foreign. That sounds impossible. But once you know Jesus, you realize it's a mandate. It's a requirement. It's an evidence that God's inside you. The third point is love influences personal behavior. Let me go on to verse six. It says, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, one of the things that I love about this verse where it says, does not rejoice in iniquity, when agape love is present, you really have no pleasure in hoping harm on anyone else. You have, you know, you ever had, see those people, man, if, if I could get them back, I feel good even thinking about how I could, I could pay them back. You know, love does not rejoice in any iniquity. Love does not rejoice in any sin, my Lord. But it rejoices, it finds joy in the truth. Where it says it bears all things. Someone say with me, love bears all things. But what does that mean to bear all things? One of the, 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 uh, the contexts of it is you bear all things without verbally complaining about it. Have you ever seen a person say, look at all the stuff that I do for this family. I got to do this and I got to do that. Man, I'm so sick and tired of this. If I, if I got to do this for one more day, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it here, man. T- take this. I, I'm done. I'm done. You know, you're doing it, but you're complaining at the same time. Somebody help me in there. You got the whole church is mad at me. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen a person serving while complaining at the same time? Yes. Uh, what does that do to the service, somebody? You ever gone to a restaurant? Oh, let me stop. <laughs> let, me, let, me just, let me quickly move beyond that. I'm, I'm scared someone's going to throw something at me, lady Lisa. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and someone served you, but they had the wrong attitude in the service? And they complained about where they were and they hated their job and you saw them, you're like, do do I really want to even eat here or or be here? My Lord. Bearing all things, it doesn't just mean carrying all things, it means how you're carrying it when you're carrying it. And, And it means agape love says, I'll carry this, but I'll hold my peace, my Lord. I'll carry this, but I'll discipline my mouth. I'll carry this, but I'll discipline my tongue. Why? Because I'm bearing it. I can bear it, my Lord. Emotionally, physically, existentially, spiritually, and emotionally, I can bear it, my Lord, my Lord. So it bears all things. It believes all things. Love is not skeptical. It doesn't look at the one you love and say, man, I know you you said that, but I don't believe it. Oh, Jesus. Let me look down. It, It looks at the person and honesty is expected. It doesn't, it's not a big leap to embrace the words that they say. Jesus, help us. Agape love says, I know you, I see you, and I'll take you at your word. I trust you, oh Jesus, my Lord, my Lord, oh Lord, help me this morning, help me. It believes all things. Do you know God believes in you? Oh Lord. He believes in you. He believes that when you say that you love him, that you will love him, that when he instructs you, you will do. He has your best interest at heart at all times, my Lord. Someone needs to praise the Lord just for who he is. Everything that I'm saying we should do to one another, we need to realize God has done it unto us. Love hopes all things. Love, one of the objects of love is when you see the person whom you love and you say, I see something great in your future. It has a hope, my Lord. It has a hope. It speaks the words of language of positivity that tomorrow will be better than today because of who you are. I have hope for you, my God, my God, my God, my God. Do you know how many people, my Lord, have never heard the words of hope in their life by the people around them? Oh, Jesus. Do you know how many people they've heard words of death? You will never be anything. Or you're not, that's too hard for you. You're you're not, we need more hope spreaders. Oh, Jesus, my Lord, my Lord. That's agape love. And it endures all things. It literally means I'm not going to stop holding on to you. I'm going to hold on and hold on no matter what comes our way, what's testing our love, I will still be here. I will fulfill my responsibility. I'm in it for the long haul. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. 
we can endure. Say that with me, we will endure. Go ahead and say that. Say it again nice and loud, we will endure, hallelujah. Find a person next to you and say, we will endure in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and say that. Say, we will make it through, hallelujah. Go ahead and say that. Say, we will finish this fight. Go ahead and say that, hallelujah. And we shall prevail. Go ahead and say that. Now go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise, right? We will endure, my Lord. Oh, we need some people in homes that say, it doesn't matter what happens to this family, we will make it through it. We will endure because of the love that we have. For you. I'll be in it till the end, hallelujah, because of the love that God's given me here, my Lord. Fourth point is love is a bond that holds people together so that they can reach their destination together. Gifts are like effectiveness that brings uh, purpose and assignments and I know what I'm supposed to do. But love is what keeps everyone together. Day after day, morning after night, from the beginning all the way to the end. Let me read to you this scripture from John 13, 35. This is from Jesus, this is the Gospel John. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. This is that word agape. Tell the person next to you, say, we have to love. Go ahead and tell them that. Say, it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. Find another person and say, it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment, my Lord. All right, so someone, that means you have to do it out there. It says, a new commandment I give to you. And what is it? That you have agape, one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. And I love this in verse 35. By this, what's the this there? Love. The love we have for one another. All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what was Jesus telling them? He says, it isn't how much noise you make. It isn't even how dynamic your spiritual gift is. It doesn't matter how big your edifices are. It doesn't matter how good your articulation is. It doesn't matter what you do morning, noon, and night. He says, everyone will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. That is the difference between the people of God and any other people. It's the love that we show, the agape that only comes from God, whether everyone will look at us and say they are different amongst one another and I wanna be part of that kind of love in my life. It's not natural, it's supernatural, amen, church? Do you receive that word in the house this morning, church? Can you give the Lord a shout of praise for that? My Lord, my God, my God. Over the last few weeks, I've been just preaching and sharing, and one of the things that the Lord gave me last Sunday was this unique sense about some things God is doing. And I want you to know, we serve a great God. We serve a great God, a great, great, great God. I had an opportunity and when I went to speak last Sunday, the Lord changed the message right at the moment. I told the tech teams, I said, forget about everything that I sent. I said, let me just speak from my heart. And I spoke from the, the book of Joshua chapter four. And I just went and for the first time in many years, I just went completely off script and gave them a prophetic word of the Lord. And the word was, God will part the waters again. And it was just an amazing, amazing time of ministry. But what was amazing was the pastor of the church, Pastor Bob Oliver, after I ministered, he said he was in Bible study that morning, and that was the exact chapter and the exact verse from Joshua. So then I had to leave our sister church, New Covenant, and go all the way to Living Word Community for the 100th anniversary. And I just brought a greeting and I just gave them one verse from there. And then Pastor Dave Freer got up and he had to preach a text, Joshua chapter four. Same exact text. All three churches. God united us last Sunday. Same word, same message. And he did it in a way that none of us could say we even prepared for that. God just confirmed it. And in my soul, it's like God was saying, I'm getting ready to do some things and part some waters all over again. All over again. From church to church, family to family, city to city. 
How many people, you're ready right now? You are just so ready to see God's hand. But what I shared with you this morning was the part that I couldn't share. And it was that part of it, essential to it, is going to be a manifestation of God's love. God's inviting us to learn agape at a new level, at a new dimension. I believe God is just refashioning us and tightening up bonds in the church and amongst the churches. And I want us to be prepared, amen, church? That no matter what God says to do, we'll be ready. That no matter what blessing God wants to release, that we'll all be there to receive it. And I want to tell you the key is if we understand and we live and we put into practice God's love. Amen, church? So I'm going to invite you just to stand with me to your feet. Hallelujah. There might be something in this message today that you heard that you say amen to, but there might be some people in here and you're saying, you know, Pastor Aubrey, I heard everything you said about love. It appeals to me, but I never saw it. I never experienced it at home, any kind of good love. And so this is all like, like new science to me. I want you to know it's okay. It's supernatural love. That God's love comes from Him and it's available to all of us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in the house this morning and saying, Pastor Aubrey, I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to start my walk with Him. I want His love in my life and I want to show it through my own. Just raise your hand right where you are and I'll take a moment to pray with you right where you are. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to accept Him as my Lord and as my Savior. I want to give my life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to give my life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Accept Him as my Lord and Savior. And to everyone that's made that decision, you can go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise if you're thankful this morning that His love reigns in you. Lord, today we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your love, your kindness, and your mercy. And we thank you, Lord, that even as we hear this word, you're going to give the scenarios where we have to put it to practice. There's some difficult people, Lord, and we're going to need your wisdom. We're going to need your discernment. We're going to need to learn how to love with skill and with wisdom, how to be authentic to you and not be victims to others. We're going to need your protection. We're going to need your blood. We're going to need your knowledge. We're going to need your counsel. So we say yes to you in all of it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we believe and we trust that there's a pathway that you're forging to lead some of us out of the situations that we're in so that we can experience your victory. Well, teach us the steps to take. Send those who will walk amongst us to guide us so we can experience your love, your will, and your way. And Lord, we pray right now, Lord, for every person who came into your house this morning with need. And we say thank you for supplying it right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for blessing them. Thank you, Lord, for sending your provision. Thank you, Lord, for rebuking the adversary for their sake. Thank you, Lord, for reestablishing their relationships. Thank you, Lord, for turning around dissension and turning around arguments in the name of Jesus and bringing communication back to the forefront so that they can understand the words that one another is saying, how they're saying it, and why they're saying it in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your victory, your peace, your salvation, and your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church says, amen. And amen. Let's go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise this morning.